So let's get started with the typical symptoms you might have of cardiovascular disease, and then we'll discuss what tests I use in my practice with my own patients to help determine if someone has heart issues or it's something else. First classic story of heart disease or even a heart attack is jaw or neck pain, particularly left jaw, left neck pain, and left shoulder and arm pain. Chest pain doesn't always center in the heart, and everybody's pretty convinced their heart's right here in the middle of the chest. Many, many times people with heart disease with narrowing of coronary arteries or even having a heart attack don't present with a typical elephant sitting on their chest. Many women never get the typical signs of heart disease like neck or arm or shoulder pain. Interestingly, many women in my practice, their presentation of angina, which is chest pain, is nausea or even vomiting. Many of my women never get the chest tightness, chest heaviness, but nausea is frequently one of their biggest complaints. On the other hand, heaviness with exertion is usually very useful. If you're having trouble climbing that second set of stairs and you get short of breath, or the word heaviness is very good because my patients use it all the time, or tightness in the chest, or if you're out doing your usual walking routine, and you notice that your chest gets tight or that you feel more short of breath and then you stop and it goes away and then you start going again and then it starts again, that's a typical sign that something is amiss. Uh, my own father used to be a fairly decent runner in his uh, mid-70s. And he noticed on the hills in San Diego, at about mile two, he had this funny heaviness in his chest that he'd never had before, and he'd stop, and it would go away, and he'd start again, and son of a gun, it would appear again. And to me, that was a tip-off. And guess what? We got a cardiac catheterization, and sure enough, he had a narrowing and a coronary artery, and he got a stent and went about his business. But it was that story. He didn't get short of breath. He didn't have chest pain. Uh, it was this heaviness that he reported that tipped me off. Overall fatigue. Now, there are innumerable causes of fatigue and tiredness. But quite frankly, if your heart is having problems pumping because of lack of blood flow, then less blood flow flows to your lungs and your muscles. And Everyday fatigue in doing everyday activities that you used to be able to do is a red flag and needs to be investigated. Now, there's many causes of this. There can be leaks in heart valves. There can be narrowing in heart valves. But this is all part of the heart, and it needs to be investigated. Over the last 20 years, I've been seeing, as other people have been seeing, a huge increase in pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hyperplasia. This, in my practice, is an autoimmune disease, but this can frequently present with shortness of breath and fatigue and tiredness when going about doing the things you want to do. Now, Google MD says sleep apnea is a sign of heart disease. Uh, wrong, but sleep apnea is a really good cause of heart disease. So heart disease does not produce sleep apnea. There's nothing in it that will produce sleep apnea, but it absolutely can cause heart disease. Now here's one that I get all the time, trouble achieving or maintaining an erection. Now I know guys, you don't connect bedroom problems with problems of the heart, but erectile dysfunction is a very early sign of arterial damage to blood vessels. And what goes on in the lower parts goes on in your coronary arteries. I won't give a man a prescription for any of the erection drugs without having them pass a stress test. 
in my office or somebody else's office. It's that important. So the word of warning is if you have erectile dysfunction and you need one of these vasodilating drugs to achieve an erection, that should be the biggest red flag that you have narrowings in other parts of your body and the one you want to worry about most, of course, is your heart. Please, please, please take care and don't use these things without working up the rest of you. Now, there's a form of vascular disease where the arteries to the legs are affected, and that's called peripheral vascular disease, PVD. This is typically felt when you're out walking or doing strenuous activities and you get tightness or literal cramps in your calves or even in your feet and you stop and it goes away and then you start up again only to have it start again. So this is the same sort of feeling you get in your heart and another way of saying it, it is you know, leg angina. And this is a classic sign of narrowing in the blood vessels to your leg. Now, it doesn't tell you where the narrowing is, although traditionally, if you get cramps in your butt or your thigh, the narrowing is usually up in your belly or right at your groin. If the narrowing is farther down, then the narrowing can be farther down as well. But this is a sign that you need to have studies. We can easily do ultrasounds of the arteries of your legs and pinpoint these narrowings. It's easy to get a CT uh, angiogram of your legs, a CT, uh, an MR angiogram. But if you're getting this, it's time to investigate it. Now, one topic that gets dismissed that I think is really important is symptoms of carotid artery disease. Now, one of the classic symptoms that I see all the time is what's called hemorrhosis fugax. What the heck is that? Well, people get this experience of literally having a shade come down over one eye. It's almost like somebody pulling the blinds down. And it lasts for a few seconds, maybe a half a minute or a minute, and then the shade goes back up. And people rub their eyes, they think they have something in their eyes. This is actually a sign of a tiny blood clot that hits the retinal artery in your eye, shuts off the flow of blood to your retina, and then it dissolves, it's that small. So that's a classic symptom that many, many, many people ignore, that there's a little plaque breaking off from your carotid arteries. What else can change? There's actually four big blood vessels that go up to your brain from your chest. Two in the front called the carotid arteries. That's where you feel your pulse. And two in the back that are smaller called the vertebral arteries. Some people get dizzy with a sudden change of their head position or a quick look to the side. And this can actually be one of these arteries that's got a narrowing getting more critically lowered, particularly typical of people who have vertebral artery disease. People who have vertebral artery disease are more likely to say they get dizzy when they suddenly change head positions or look up or look down. Now, this is one that I hear quite a bit, and I'm sorry to use the pun. If you hear a whoosh in one ear, almost like a stream, and not the other. Or you hear a whoosh in one ear when you're laying down on a pillow and not the other when you're laying down on a pillow. This can frequently be a sign that there literally is a narrowing in your carotid artery and it's not your imagination. Now again, it's easy to get a carotid artery duplex. There's nothing invasive about it. Okay, so these are the symptoms that I want you to look for. These are the symptoms that patients tell me about that usually lead me to further investigation. Okay, so what should you ask your doctors to get? Most doctors are going to get a cholesterol profile on you. Quite frankly, it's really not going to tell you much of anything. Now, 
Cholesterol can be high in my practice, but I use tests to look at whether cholesterol is activated, whether it's oxidized, and I have and treat a number of patients with very high LDL cholesterols who have absolutely no coronary artery disease by CT coronary angiograms. What's far more important is to look for markers of inflammation. I measure markers of inflammation, including heart-specific C-reactive protein. I use the plaque test, the LPPLA2 test, which looks at inflammation on blood vessels. I use myeloperoxidase, which is the Cleveland Clinic's favorite marker of inflammation. And yes, I will perform stress tests. Now, there are multiple forms of stress tests. I like to use a nuclear scan in my office, but stress tests are not perfect. Stress tests can miss true coronary artery disease 15 to 20% of the time. And this lecture won't go into why that happens, but they can miss. Currently, in the past, the definitive test was a coronary angiogram in the cath lab. Now, CT coronary angiograms, particularly the clearly test, is my test of choice. They're becoming much more available. They're becoming much more affordable. The beauty of the clearly test is that it uses artificial intelligence to look underneath uh, calcified areas in blood vessels and to see underneath those calcifications. And a CT coronary angiogram is a minimally invasive test that really gives you a 3D picture of what's going on. And I'll often, when I hear these symptoms, I see these complaints, I'll get a CT coronary angiogram for the definitive look at what's going on. More amazing episodes just like this one. Watch now. Most commercial mouthwashes destroy your oral microbiome and actually raise your blood pressure, exactly what you don't want to do.